In this lecture, we'll look at some of the things that Aristotle says about human happiness or human flourishing in his famous book, Nicomachean Ethics, specifically in Book 1 and a little bit of what he says in Book 10. Aristotle of Stagira is one of the greatest philosophers of all time and one of the most influential. His years are about 384 to 322 BCE. Plato once famously called Aristotle the mind of the Academy. The Academy was Plato's sort of club in Athens where they got together and discussed philosophy and tried to live a philosophical life. Basically Plato said that Aristotle was his star student. It so happens that Aristotle was personal tutor to the great conqueror Alexander the Great. He's what we would call a polymath. A polymath is somebody who is really good, somebody who is expert level good at a whole bunch of different things. You might also say that Aristotle is a proto-scientist, that is, sort of like a scientist before there was such a thing as modern science. Aristotle did things like dissect animals to discover what their organs did and how their limbs functioned and things like that. And we have many extant works from Aristotle. Many works of his survive to the current day, and you can read them in English translation. And if you just even take a look at the table of contents of this works, you'll be amazed. This is the two-volume standard set of Aristotle's works in translation, edited by Jonathan Barnes. These are two thick, heavy volumes. It includes everything that survives from Aristotle, and it also includes some spurious works, things that were sometimes later attributed to him, but that we now think he did not write. If you scan the table of contents, you'll see that he wrote about ethics, he wrote about politics, he wrote about rhetoric and poetry, he wrote about the parts of animals, he wrote about the soul or the mind. You'll find out that the word physics comes from one of his treatises by that title. He had a theory of the natural world and natural things and just change in general. There's quite a lot in Aristotle. The bad news is he's hard to read. What we have from him seem to be kind of like his lecture notes. So they're compressed, they have false starts in them, they're just difficult to read. They're not great works of literature like a lot of Plato's dialogues are. One of the things that people like about Aristotle is that he tries to begin with common sense. He doesn't just want to build theories in thin air that have no connection to reality. So what he does towards the start of his book, The Nicomachean Ethics, is he just collects different opinions about happiness. Now his term for happiness is eudaimonia, you could also translate it maybe as flourishing. It has to do with doing well. Aristotle thinks that a happy life is a pleasant life. He thinks that to be happy will involve having pleasure and having various positive states of mind like peace and joy and so on. But he does not, as we'll see, define happiness in terms of mental states. So he really is asking what is it to be well off? What is it, he would say, to live well and to do well? So again, this is not Aristotle's theory. This is just what people say that he's considering right here. So it's like he's collected a big basket full of opinions and he's going to dump them out on the table and just see what we have there. And then, then after he's done that and considered some other theories that have come before him, he will then give his own theory, which accounts for as many of these common opinions as possible. The first assumption is that happiness is complete. It's a good state and it's a complete good state in that if you are truly happy there isn't any big thing that you're lacking. Happiness is supposed to be secure, that is something that's not too easily lost. It's supposed to be divine. A happy life is sort of a divine life. You're in a sense living like a god. Happiness is something which is spread over a whole life. Aristotle is not concerned with how you happen to feel at one single moment or how you're doing right now. Maybe you're doing great right now, but if one were to look at your entire life from start to finish, it would be a really crappy life. On the other hand, maybe right now you're in terrible pain. Maybe you've got a terrible toothache, and so right now you're really suffering. But still, if one looked at your whole life, you would say, wow, that is a flourishing life. That person really was well off on the whole. So you can see he's not considering any short-term sort of thing. He's looking at the big picture. And this is how they looked at it in the ancient Greek discussion. People say that happiness requires good external circumstances. It requires things like having enough money, 
having friends, maybe having a family, things like that, living during a time of peace perhaps. Finally, he says that people say happiness is something that we all aim at. So again, this is not Aristotle's theory, but this is his quick survey of things that people in his day would say about happiness. This last point brings up what I call Aristotle's psychological assumption, which is that happiness is the chief ultimate good that we are always aiming at. So whenever we make choices, whenever we pursue any end, whenever we pursue any aim, we're pursuing that in order that we can ultimately get happiness. Now I'm not sure this psychological assumption is true. I think people can make self-destructive choices and they're not pursuing happiness. But still, it's an interesting idea and I do think that your beliefs about what happiness consists in, that vision of yours does guide your other choices in life. So it's important, he thinks, to have a correct view about what human, human flourishing is. If you thought to be happy was just to have a lot of money, for instance, that would lead you to make a lot of terrible choices. Maybe you would completely neglect your health and your friendships and your own mental development and you would just make money as fast as you can. You know, so I don't know, next thing you know you're selling your kidneys and your blood and uh, you're chopping off your limb and selling that to somebody. Wow, now you've got a lot of money. Oh wait, now I just damaged my health and I, nobody likes me anymore. So if you had a really stupid simplistic view about what a good life is, what it is to be well off, this is going to mess up the rest of the choices that you make. But let me go back to this idea of an ultimate good that we're aiming at. Let me give you an illustration. You'd probably agree with something like this. Someone asked you why are you watching this video, you would answer in order to learn this material. Now just imagine that you're talking to a curious child, one of those annoying six-year-olds who always asks why, 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 why. So I say, you're watching this video to learn this material? Why? You say, to do well on the test. Yeah, but why? In order to pass this class. Why? To get a degree. Why? To get a good job. Why? To make good money. Why? To provide for my own needs and the needs of my family. Why? Maybe you would say to make family life possible. Why? Why do you want that? Why do you want to make family life possible? You would probably at that point say, because I want to be happy. I think happiness requires having a certain kind of family life. You know, I've got to have a place to live, got to have enough food to eat, and so on. I can't just be barely surviving. So you can see how there's kind of an embedded hierarchy of aims that you have. Right now, your nearest, so to speak, aim is to learn this material. But ultimately, farthest down, you're aiming to be happy. This is how Aristotle thinks about it. If this annoying six-year-old kid were to go on and ask, well, why do you want to be happy? The idea is, well, that's just a foolish question. Everybody wants to be happy. It's the ultimate aim to ask, what do you want that in order for? It's like asking, what's north of the North Pole? Nothing's north of the North Pole. If happiness is the ultimate good that we're aiming at, then there's nothing further that we're aiming at when we aim for happiness. So here are some of the theories of happiness we have seen so far. First, we've seen the view of Plato that happiness is just being a good person or being just. A simplistic theory, there is some appeal to it because we all want to be good, arguably. And we're very upset if people think that we're bad. Maybe we're upset if we really are bad, if we think we're bad. The more radical theory was argued for by Glaucon, which is that happiness just is living as one pleases while having a just reputation. So when people are looking, you follow the laws of morality. When people are not looking, you just do whatever you want. And if you can get away with it, that would be a happy life. Aristotle also mentions the idea that happiness is having honor, that a happy life is a life of honor. This is probably a popular one today. A lot of people, you think about the contestants you see on American Idol, all those people, hundreds of them, lining up just to try out, even people that don't have any talent. Why are they trying to do that? Well, they want to be famous. But would that be a happy life if you were famous? Maybe some of those people think that. It's about as foolish, I think, as thinking that having a lot of money will make you happy, but that is, I think, what some people believe. I want to add to the theories that Aristotle mentions a couple of ones that I find when I discuss these things with students today. 
How about this? Happiness just is satisfying one's desires without interference. People have this idea, look, I just need to be me. I need to really be myself. If I could just stop being interfered with by parents and teachers and who knows what, the president, whoever you think uh, is keeping you down. If people would just stop interfering me and I was just able to pursue my desires without interference, well, that would be a happy life. That, that just would be happiness. Perhaps a related view or a similar view is that to be happy is just to think that one is happy. Now this is a very convenient thing to think, right? You could say, I can think whatever I want. Happiness for me is whatever I choose. I'm in control of my own happiness and I don't need to have any advice from anybody about it because all I have to do to be happy is just think that I am happy and that's all it is to be happy, is to think that you're happy. Thinking it so makes it be so. If you hold the fourth view here or the fifth view, you probably think that what happiness is is relative to different persons. It all depends on what sort of desires you have, what sort of desires you find yourself with. So maybe you'd say for one person, making money uh, is what would be happiness for them. For another person, gaining power would be happiness relative to them. For another person, maybe having friends would be happiness for them. Now, Aristotle would, of course, agree that different people like different things. And he does see, he does think, as we'll see eventually, that there is a kind of person relativity to happiness. And yet, at the same time, he thinks that you can give a general account of what it is for a human being to be happy or to be well off. And we'll see what that is eventually. In the next segment of this lecture, we will look at how Aristotle objects to each and every one of these theories.